My name is Ryan Hassan. I'm the current executive director of NGO Forum on ADB. I'm a Bangladeshi national and I moved to the Philippines in 2012 and I've been working with NGO Forum on ADB ever since. The mandate of the civil society network as we know as NGO Forum on ADB is to hold the Asian Development Bank accountable and since 2015 we are also looking at the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank who we try to hold accountable as well. Um, I have been working on IFI, International Financial Institution issues, since 2003. So this has been my career for over 15, 16 years now. International financial institutions are pivotal to what we know as the world financial system. Right now, no country is isolated from the global market system. So that means our governments, our markets are all interconnected. In this interconnection, the international financial institution is a leverage point of moving finances from the western and northern parts of the world to countries where uh, there is a development need. For the World Bank or the ADB, the biggest shareholders are the US, the Japanese, the European Union, so on and so forth. They put in their overseas development assistance or public finance into these banks. Then this money filters down into national governments in the form of projects, in the form of activities and policy reforms. At this point, one of the most important international financial institutions would definitely be the Asian Development Bank. It was one of the largest energy investors and infrastructure investors in Southeast Asia for the entire decade of the 70s, 80s, and the 90s. Initially, it used to be an investor in agricultural transformation, moving from rural agriculture to commercial agriculture. By the time you get into the 80s and the 90s, you realize ADB is starting to do connectivity projects, building roads, building bridges, bridging hydropower. The world that we live in comes from a history of development paradigms. We at Asia are the recipients of what development paradigms were set up in Europe and the West. So when you look at post Second World War and the reconstruction of Europe, it was done through the industrialization of those economies. And the industrialization's bedrock was energy investment. And the energy investment in Europe at that time or in the US was driven by coal power. So when you look at these uh, smaller countries which are starting to emerge in Asia over the 60s, 70s and 80s, they required energy. And if you look at ADB's energy portfolio, then you will see a lot of coal-fired power plants. I think that we did a study in NGO Forum where we looked at ADB's energy sector lending from 2009 to 2019 and it was discovered that by 2012, Asian Development Bank was the largest financier of coal power plants. So now we have met the climate crisis head on in 2015. So there is an enormous responsibility of these banks first to own up to their energy investments which have been dirty and fossil fuel and then how do they change their portfolio and trigger governments to meet their uh, climate change agreements of reducing the global temperature to 1.5. First let's look at the IFI lending policy on climate and energy. So traditionally, most of the multilateral development banks uh, have an energy policy or an energy sector strategy. So the ADB energy policy is of 2009 and the AIIB energy sector strategy comes out in 2016 odd. So these two energy documents kind of direct the flow of the financing coming out of these banks. The ADB energy policy being from 2009 does not address the Paris Agreement of 2015. Therefore, it has provisions for coal power plants. It has uh, provisions for correlated infrastructure. It has uh, provisions for fossil fuels such as oil and gas power plants, etc., etc. And it also has um, um, provisions for hydropower and geothermal energy, which are bracketed and under renewable, which is a huge debate. Um, at this point, if you specifically look at the Asian Development Bank model and you see what is happening in the global geopolitical debate around climate, you see that the European voices uh, and the European government voices are very pro-climate. Uh, there is also a very important aspect of the climate debate since the US pulled out after Barack Obama. Only China is left as one of the leaders of the 
Paris alignment. So at that stage of the geopolitics, it has tremendous impact on how the AIIB or the ADB starts moving around in the climate space. So the weakest, weakest links, I would say, are the opportunities of influence. So if Europe continues to say we do not want to do any more coal power plants in Germany, then the German executive director of both the AIB and the ADB will be our champion on making sure that the portfolio does not go into fossil fuels from these banks and moves towards renewables. So the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank has a much shorter story. Uh, it's established in 2016 and China is the largest shareholder of the AIB. Its shareholding is 22%, which is the highest shareholding by any one single country in any multilateral development bank in the world. Now, this was often touted in Western media as a Chinese bank, as a Chinese bank. So we've been engaging this bank for the last three, four years. And something very significant happened in 2019. The AIIB has changed its governance structure. In any other MDB, the board approves a project and then the project gets financed. But in 2019, they made a new rule that up to $300 million worth of projects can be approved by the president alone bypassing the AIIB board of directors. And this is decided therefore in the Beijing headquarters. So the question on the table is, is AIIB fulfilling a Chinese agenda? Because they can now approve projects without having to go to the multilateral development bank board structure. Also in the context of how transparent is AIIB? Unlike the ADB, they don't have resident missions anywhere. So you're only dependent on their website to provide you information. Local people did not get project related information in a time bound manner prior to construction. Local people didn't even know that the project was going to be built, be it a large hydro, be it a gas power plant. Tomorrow morning, a bulldozer is in front of your face. And there's no AIB official which comes with it because they completely work with the private sector or a private corporation. The Asian Development Bank has a historical track record of destroying the, the entire climate scenario that we have now because it has a bad, dirty fossil fuel portfolio. So what you want the ADB to do first, not do the bad thing anymore, start funding renewables. And the second thing you want them to do is encourage governments to change their policies to, towards a Paris Agreement goal, right? That, that's what you want to do. The question is, are they doing it? We can see that they have promised $80 billion in climate finance. But then if you deconstruct that 80 billion for the next 10 years, you hope that it would all be renewable and it will all be zero emissions, but it's not. Clean coal technology projects fall under ADB's $80 billion portfolio. Um, it is doing large hydro, which has huge methane emissions because they clear out all the trees which absorb the carbon. So there's a huge carbon emission there. What you can say, you can counter argue with me, does ADB not do renewable solar farms? Does it not do wind farms? Yes, it does in Sri Lanka. It does in the Philippines in a very big way. But if you look at the scale of the portfolio, then you're looking at incremental moves in the right direction. But what you need is system change of the entire portfolio towards renewables. And that is not happening. At Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the overall slogans and the rhetoric is very green. But when you look at the real drivers, as I mentioned, 42 projects have been financed. How many renewable energy projects? One. One photovoltaic solar farm in Egypt. But the rest is all infrastructure which is related to export processing growth. It's ports, it's gas pipelines, it's connectivity, and it's fossil fuel. What has happened since the 2008 financial crisis is that the global economy is slowing down. Now, because the global economy is slowing down, you have to find markets which are strong enough for the neoliberal project to push through. And the newer emerging markets are now in Asia. These banks are saying the right thing of the development model, but they still want to finance projects which are going to generate revenue for the global market. So infrastructure business is an asset class. 
And this is where the IFIs are trying to place themselves. They're trying to solicit more private sector. They want to build projects which do not address development needs, but address commercial needs. And this is where we have to watch them very, very carefully. Are these development banks? And is this the development that we want? So if, what would a local community representative, a farmer or a fisher folk or a child uh, in Myanmar or Indonesia, in the villages of the Philippines want? They would want clothing, shelter, healthcare, education. They would want clean water. They would want a natural environment where they can live and breathe. They do not want an export processing zone. So when you look at the entire RFI architecture, the development model which is promoted by international financial institutions, it is not matching with the sustainable development needs of the people. So local communities have to voice this out. The battleground is not stopping the IFIs. The battleground is at the national and local level that is this the development agenda which you want your state to fulfill. That is convincing your state to take financing for the right projects. And this is where we need to make our voices heard. This is where we need to consolidate our energies. This is where civil society has to build bridges and make constituencies with people who care about the development agenda of the future. We are in a climate crisis. And the way these big projects are coming at us, we need to counter this with our own development agenda and we have to do it all together.